Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. On today's Thriller Zone, we welcome Kyle Mills, New York Times bestselling author of the Vince Flynn Mitch Rap series and his latest thriller, Code Red. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kyle Mills to the Thriller Zone. Hello. Thanks for having me. So Kyle and I were talking, you know, in the green room before, and he said, you know, you're just, you're delaying my, uh, uh, my happy hour. So yeah, take your time, Dave. Thanks a lot. And I'm like, happy hour? Dude, Jackson, hold, oh, you're only like two hours. Oh no, I'm in Spain. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, you know, I'm not above starting happy hour early. Right, right. <clears throat> Who is? What's wrong with that? Exactly. We're going to be talking about Code Red here in just a minute, the Vince Flynn novel, and uh, fantastic read, like big surprise there. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you really dropped the ball. No one's ever going to say about you, Kyle. I mean, it's just an amazing read. But let me, let me take a quick split second, because we were watching a new television series, and I know this is off the beaten path, but it's my show. We get to do that. Uh, what was the name of that? Who is Aaron Carter? And it's, have you seen it? You know, no, it popped up in my Netflix, though. It, it's so funny. We, we finished the series last night, and I turned to my wife, Tammy, and I said, that was good? I mean, it was good, and it was intriguing, but it wasn't, it was like uh, the depth of a little waiting pond. I was wa wanting more. But here's my favorite thing. It was all shot in Spain, like outside Barcelona. Oh, Really? And I'm like, oh my God, where is this? And then we, st I started drilling down because I can't, you know, I don't, I have no attention span. And so I said, I hear Spain is a great place to retire. She said, really? I said, oh yeah, I've been reading this all over the place lately. And then here you, I found out that you're living in Spain. That is so wild. Yeah, it is a nice place to retire. I know a bunch of people that have. And it's so uh, affordable according to these research. And, and there's this, uh, this is panel uh, online that that'll teach you exactly how to set up retirement in Spain. And it's way easier than I ever would have imagined. So kudos to you. When did this happen? Yeah. Uh, we've been living here on and off for a few years now. So we okay. live here for a year and in uh, Wyoming for a year and just kind of go back and forth. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's not without its challenges, I can tell you that right now. I mean, we're renovating a house right now and uh, the bureaucracy. And then, you know, you're an immigrant, so you, know, you get to spend your time sitting in the immigration office with all your paperwork, hoping they don't deport you and stuff like that. But it's, you know, those, are, those things are interesting. You know? it's, yeah. it's something different. Well, Kyle, I feel like as though I should know you. I mean, between your prolific uh, number of New York Times bestsellers, uh, including, of course, all the Vince Flynn books and the fact that I follow you on social media and you, I, and I was just thinking as I was warming up for the show, how can I not have met Kyle yet? He's like one of the biggest dudes in the industry. And it's, it's just weird that we haven't met yet. Yeah. You know, I'm honestly, I'm kind of a reclusive, I think. I mean, one, I live part-time in Spain, which sure. people don't get around to very much. And the other part in Wyoming, which nobody ever goes to. So um, maybe that's it. But yeah. I'm trying to get out a little more. I went to VoucherCon last year, and um, unfortunately, I'm going to miss it this year, but maybe next year. For those folks who tune in for the show to hear about superstars like you and hear about their books, 
uh, I want to make sure I do this up front so I don't lose my audience, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. So, so Code Red, which we talked about, uh, hits bookshelves on September 12th. This show will drop one day prior to that, so on the 11th. And uh, how are you feeling about this book? I mean, outside of the normal, I'm excited, you know, goose, bo- uh, goose pimples and all that. How are you feeling about it? And by that, I mean, are you as excited about this book as that very first Flynn book, which I believe was The Survivor, right? Right. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say I was excited about The Survivor as I terrified about The Survivor. Because, you know, at that point, I'd written a book about Mitch Rapp. I didn't know if anybody really wanted me to write a book about Mitch Rapp, if they wanted the series continued. You know, I talked to a few fans over email and stuff, but... You know, I was really concerned that it would go out there and everybody would hate it and uh, or not want it to exist or whatever. And uh, so that one was a little more stressful than anything. Fortunately, people really liked it and they wanted to have the series continue. Um, yeah, I feel really good about this because, you know, we have a thing that was uh, was dreamed up by my publicist called the Ambassador Program. And we send a bunch of books out to you know big Mitch Rapp fans prior to publication. So it's kind of nice because you get to kind of interact with them on social media and email and stuff and find out what people think of the book. And people seem to really love this book, which is great because it's my last and I wanted to go out on a, you know, on a strong note. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. I got that news. I don't know when that news came across my radar. It wasn't in the last couple of weeks. It's been a while, but I was like, Kyle is doing what? And then, of course, you think to yourself, well, you've been doing this for how many years? So it makes sense to move on to find other things. Plus, you've written uh, a stack of NYT bestsellers for uh, quite a long time. So it, it, it begs. I guess it begs the immediate question, and I'm jumping ahead of myself not a surprise there, that what will you be doing with all that righteous time next? Are you, or are you, you know, do you have a new series in mind? Do you, do you have a standalone? You're going to take some time off. What's, uh, no, I have a new series in mind. I, uh, I had written a book called fade many years ago, uh, about kind of this crazy former Navy SEAL who's a bit suicidal. And, uh, in the end he gets shot. Um, and in my mind, when I wrote the book, he was killed. But then as time went on, I started to see him like maybe in a coma because I really loved that character and fans really loved the character. And they always send me, you know, emails saying, you know, are you going to bring this character back? We'd like to hear some more about him. And so I've been kind of working on that in the back of my head for ever, a decade. And uh, now I want to resurrect him almost literally. So (laughs) uh, and I have kind of a series in mind for him. So that's what I've been working on uh, since I finished the, the Mitch Rapp book. It's interesting, and I hope this is a compliment, and I know you've dabbled in the, and you're a fan of the Bourne world, but it does remind me of that very first Bourne where he shows up and you think he's dead and all of a sudden, now this is probably slightly unrelated, but it, it just made me think of Jason Bourne and that kind of a character that is, you think is out and all of a sudden he's back in and then, so I'm really excited about hearing about it, seeing that come to life. Yeah, it should be it should be fun. I you know I'd like to tackle some of the kind of current problems that are going around in the world, and he's an interesting character to do it from because he's kind of a little bit philosophical and a little kind of wacky. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it'll be an interesting an interesting view of the world, and still you know big action packed thrillers with huge you know, concepts and, and stuff that I like to do. So uh, give me a chance to explore something a little bit different and, and, and to give fans a different perspective on Mitch Rapp. You know, uh, Don Bentley's taken over for me and he's a great writer and a huge fan of the series. So uh, I'm looking forward to being a fan again. Yeah, that is one nice thing about sitting on the sidelines and going, you know what, I'm going to sip my cocktail uh, out by the uh, pool of the ocean and just watch someone else do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> and it's exciting, too, to get to read the books again. And I haven't gotten to really read a Mitch Rapp book in a decade because I've been writing them. And, and talking about a guy who is so perfectly suited to take over that franchise, I mean, mega talent, probably 
certainly knows how to flat out write. Probably one of the nicest, most grounded, level-headed, down-to-earth guys you'll ever meet. I mean, kudos to whoever made that, pulled that together. Yeah, and, you know, he's mili- ex-military, ex-FBI. He's written for Clancy. Um, he was kind of the dream candidate, though, honestly, I didn't think they'd be able to get him because, you know, he was doing so well with the Clancy stuff. You know, he's coming out top of the New York Times list and stuff. So we were lucky. What do you think? Now, this is just purely your opinion conjecture. What do you think that Don, because you know Don pretty well, what do you think will be the flavor he will bring that is slightly different than the flavor that you brought? I'm just curious. If you have any ideas, you know, I don't know. He's been bouncing around a lot of different ideas and they're all really compelling. Um, Some are very similar to what I've been doing and some are really different. So um, I wish I could answer that question. I'm going to have to ply him a little bit when we're on tour together and see if I can see if I can get a little a little uh, a few specifics about what the next book's going to be about. That's right. I just read where you and he are going to be hitting the circuit to promote Code Red. And what are those plans looking like? I think I saw a photo. Maybe it was on your Twitter feed or your Instagram feed with the poison pen, maybe. Yeah, poison pen, uh, Once Upon a Crime in Minneapolis and the Larkin Owl in uh, it's outside. Of, it's in Georgia, outside of uh, Georgia, the city outside uh-huh. of Austin, Texas. So, uh, yeah, we'll be doing those three appearances chatting about where the books have been, where they're, you know, we'll get a little bit, hopefully, about where they're going and uh, talk about the Clancy stuff and everything. So uh, it should be fun. Well, you know, he'll be wearing that uh, plaid cowboy shirt. shirt. Is. Cow- <laughs> cowboy shirt, cowboy boots. <laughs> hey, uh, from my fictional uh, co-conspirator character, Captain Obvious, comes a question. What do you suppose, and again, this is me asking you to dive into the minds of other people, which is completely uh, ridiculous, but it's just kind of what I do. What do you suppose was that single biggest magic sauce, secret sauce that Vince Flynn had? Because when he came on the scene, I remember just going, wait a minute, where, who is this guy? Where did this guy come from? Where did these, I mean, it was, it was bigger than life. And I remember just gobbling up those books back in the day. What do you think that sauce was? You know, one of the things that I, I mean, I read all those books again. I'd read them over many, many years. I read them all again before I started in one big push. And he did a lot of things well. But one of the things that nobody ever really talks about with him that I think is super important in his books is he created these really rich villains that you hated and you really wanted to get there. You know, people talk about Mitch Rapp, what a great character he is, and he's super iconic, and that's true, but he's only as good as the guys you want him to kill. And so that's one of the things that I loved about those books, is you're just waiting for that guy to get shot in the face by Mitch Rapp, you know, and it was so satisfying when it happened. So I think that's one of the things that people don't think about when they think of Vince, but that if you actually study his books like I did, it's a huge component. I had a conversation with Lee Goldberg recently, and the show's going to drop soon. And I, he brought up something that was so, it's so simple, yet so profound. And we were talking about, you know, how does one learn how to not duplicate the secret sauce, but how to really understand how a good book works. And he said, take a book that you read that you really love break it down. The blueprint is right there in front of you in black and white, deconstruct it, put it on a big poster board or whatever, and then learn from it and use some of that technique moving forward. And I'm like, I had never heard anyone. And it sounds so, you're like, uh, yeah, Dave, how you doing? Um, but it is one of the greatest little, uh, lessons that I picked up. And I thought it's, it it made me think of what you just said is like, just, if you're going to read, deconstruct, learn how the pros do it, and move on, you know? Yeah. I mean, when I decided I was going to write a novel, um, I didn't really have any background in it other than being a fan of, of novels, and particularly thriller novels. And I read, I remember now, I read Cardinal of the Kremlin, which was probably my favorite thriller novel. I read Kiss the Girls, which was super popular at the time, Patterson, and The Pelican Brief. And all really different 
because I, that's why I picked them. They're like really different novels, but all very, very successful, and people loved them. And kind of broke it down. I probably still have them sitting around with all my notes and highlighting in them, and like, why did this work? Why didn't this work for me? And all that. And man, I learned a lot from that. This is one thing that I find so intriguing about you, Kyle, is the fact that you, are, you know, I talked to so many people on this show now two and a half years in that say, oh, I wanted to be a writer since I was a child. My very first story was eight years old and I've been writing ever since. Or, you know, I picked it up as a hobby in grade school or college and I never stopped. You're, you had a completely different path and kind of a late bloomer, if you will. And then you have this prolific career. Tell me how you made that happen. Ah, uh, yeah, it was uh, not really expected. Um, <laughs> I uh, worked for a bank. I was a loan. I did corporate loans for a bank. And I um, was a really fanatical rock climber. Those were the, that was basically my life. I worked at the bank and I climbed rocks. And... Uh, I realized I never ever never really did anything creative, so I wanted to do try something creative, and I was going to build furniture. And my wife reminded me that I wasn't very handy, and so I don't think she really didn't. We live in Wyoming at the time, and that she yeah. didn't uh, want me to fill the garage with tools and have to park outside and all that. And she's the one that said, "Well, you love reading. Why don't you write a novel?" And uh, I don't know. I never took any English class. I have an economics degree, so it didn't seem like a great idea, but it kind of intrigued me. And so I kind of studied up on it, got some how-to books, read those novels and thought, yeah, I'm just going to embark on this and, you know, my mom will read it and, you know, it'll go in a drawer. Yeah. So it turned out pretty good, I thought. And Uh. I thought, well, maybe I'll try to get it published. And it ended up getting published and became a national bestseller and which is great but I honestly I had never planned to write a second book so oh my, God. my agent signed me to a two book deal and I was kind of panicked because I had no ideas never never considered it so I didn't even know if I had a computer or a place <laughs> back then I think I wrote it like I'd bring home the laptop from the from the bank and write oh, at night on it oh jeez you know so. this this blows my mind because I think of all the people, and probably including myself, that have fantasized for years. Oh, man, if I could just, you know, hit it and blah, 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 fill in the blank. And then for someone to kind of come at it from nowhere and then hit it so well. But, you know, this this begs the question or or challenges the thought, I think, that if you operate in the realm of passion, meaning you find something that really makes you tick and then you go after it with reckless abandon and you really absorb it and enjoy it and you do it without the worry of, man, can I make a living on it? I think therein lies part of the magic because you're not, it's like mercury in your hand if you've ever tried to hold mercury. When you go to reach for it and squeeze it, it just shoots out from between your fingers and you, you can't do it. So it's, you know, it's a little bit metaphysical there, I suppose. But I think sometimes when you want it so bad and you're reaching so hard uh, is is the mistake. Whereas if you just relax and lean into it and go, it's going to be okay. If it's supposed to work, it will. And then it does, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it does. I, I, I definitely advise people not to get into writing it for, you know, I'm going to make a million dollars because it really doesn't happen very often, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> even very you know, talented, very successful writers. It's not, um, it's just not necessarily a huge moneymaker. It's something you have to be passionate about. And I loved writing. I worked when I, I work really hard on it. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, you've written 23 books or something. It's easy now. It's no easier than it was before. You know, so um, you've got to really work hard on it, really hone your craft. You know, don't, you know, it's always, I'm all a person that's never good enough and I'm always recrafting things, but that's kind of the behind the scenes thing is, you know, it's not always, it's not always fun and games. A lot of sitting in your basement, you know, <laughs> worrying about this paragraph doesn't flow very well, you know? Isn't it funny? And, 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 and I get this from everybody who's on the show. <clears throat> They'll say things like, man, I'm afraid it's just going to suck, but you've just written 23 number one hits. Yeah, but 
this one could suck. And I'm just always amazed at why we as writers tend to kind of lean into that negative space, that self-doubt. I, yeah. You know, and it's funny because it's a, you know, all the spouses have the same stories of, oh, they're tearing around the house again going, this is crap, throwing wadding up paper and throwing it at the walls. And they're all like, oh, it always works out in the end. You do this every time. But, yeah. you know, I did on Code Red. I did on every book I've ever written. Did yeah. your wife say that? Oh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, I can't think of anything. I'm never going to think of another idea again. Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, your publisher, Emily Bessler, who is pr- very easily one of the most respected and most delightfully gracious people I've ever had a chance to interact with, says of Code Red, in case I want to put an extra little plug in here, it is, quote, the very best book from Kyle Mills yet. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel great. Because, yeah. I mean, this is an important... I think the two most important ones have been the first one, sure. really. Yeah. But for me, a little bit the last one, too, because uh, the pressure was really on for me because I would hate for the to go out on a weak note, particularly because I think there would be an impression, you know how people are, that I kind of phoned it in because I knew I was leaving. And... So I was especially like, you know, really especially attentive to making sure that this was a really strong novel. So people would would say, you know, that I respected the the series and, and you know, Vince's memory. So hopefully I have. Yeah. And, you know, th- those were mighty big shoes to fill back in the day. But you have to walk out with this great confidence that you nailed it. And you nailed it time and time again. And you've got this legion of fans that go, Kyle did it. He carried on the torch. He did it magnificently. And while we're sad to see him go, he did a great job. I mean, that's that's a wonderful legacy to be able to leave. It is. It's been great. I mean, the, the fans have been really kind. And, you know, it's funny. On the last book, I got a lot of email and comments that they thought that was the last one that basically the, the the last chapter was kind of Mitch had dealt with this crooked president and he's back at home and that he's going to ride off in the sunset. And I got a lot of really nice like letters and comments saying, you know, this has been great. It was an amazing series and uh, this is just a great way for it to end. And I write back and I'm like, it's not ending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really nice to hear people that you know really appreciate it. You know, I get a lot of emails about you know what Vince meant to people and what the character meant to people and where they were when they picked it up. You know, and and uh, yeah, it's great to have do something that you feel like you've impacted people's lives positively, even if it's just that you know you gave them something fun to do for a couple of days. And you know that that's a really superb point, and I think about this often. We, you know, as writers, we think, oh, we want to do either we want to craft the great American novel, or we want to do something of massive significance, and so forth. But uh, so many writers that come on the show, and I think about this sometimes. Sometimes you just want to jump on a flight, and while you've got five, six, eight hours to fly, you just want to escape and not have to do spreadsheets or worry about work or la 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 and you just want to escape and i think sometimes we kind of forget that or i'm not saying we do we could forget that and forget the magic of just disappearing in some good fun entertainment yeah and it's really different now even when i started i mean the world is so much more fast-paced with the internet and you're always on and you're always got your cell phone and all this stuff and yeah, the perfect time to get on a plane. You have to shut your cell phone off and you can just disappear into another universe and, you know, let it all go for a little while. It's what I love about books. I don't feel that way about, I mean, I like TV and movie, but I, movies, but I don't feel that same way about it. I don't like completely get immersed in them the way I do a book. And I'll tell you what I think, this is my theory, Kyle, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is I'm I'm a closet indie filmmaker. I turned my very first self-published book into a film, some of my listeners might know. And there's something about 
cr- taking that story that's lived in your brain for so long and turning it into film. But the thing is, and I always say this to people, when, pe- when I hear people go, oh, but dude, the book was so much better than the movie. And I'm like, well, of course it was because you were the director inside your book. You were the director. You were building the, the sets and the scenes, and you decided who the actors were and all that. So it's always going to be deeper and richer and fuller, right? Yeah, for sure. And longer. Yeah. You know, there's only so much you can explore in two hours when you've just yeah. taken a book that would take you 10 hours to read. So, yeah, um, yeah like actors and stuff have to handle that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's always been a really different experience. I've, I've always loved, ab- above all, all things, to read. And um, it is hard to, you know, I mean, certainly you have some books that have, or movies that have transcended the books, but I feel like that's a more the exception than the rule yeah anomaly hey so let me ask you this about audiobooks are you a fan of that and i would imagine if you're well if you're and i know you're not rock climbing quite to the extent that you used to but you might be biking for instance or skiing do you ever carry along audiobooks do you ever are you an audiobook fan at all yeah i you know i've listened to them mine like little snippets of mine just to hear like what people sound like um not really. I, I like to listen to podcasts, but um, no, nah, I just I, I really like the printed page. I like to lay on my sofa and like look at words uh, sure. for some reason. And is it true the rumor I've heard that the the Thriller Zone is one of your favorite podcasts? Absolutely, my very <laughs> favorite. <laughs> Hey, uh, by the way, I was getting ready to say something about, we were talking about the finale of this book and so forth, and it made me go, ooh, and I was about to mention something about the finale scene in the book, and I'm like, oh, shh, don't do that. But how about this? Can you give my listeners an elevator pitch of Code Red? That way I, um, I mean, I could sit here and read the blur, but it's so much more interesting coming from the author so that they can get an idea of this high-octane thriller book sure, in the future. Sure. Uh, yeah, this kind of came out of my interest in uh, or fascination for really asymmetrical warfare, and the Russians how the Russians have gotten very good at at waging it. Um, but you know, it's hard to write a book about Mitch Rapp stopping you know Facebook propaganda. So I needed wanted to come up with another weapon, and the weapon I came up with in light of all the narcotics problems in the West was them engineering a really dangerous drug that would appeal to drug users across the Western world um, to kind of stick it to us and collapse our healthcare systems and all these things. And Mitch gets drawn into this in a weird way. He has a kind of has a marker out to a, a cartel leader, a huge organized crime guy who's one of the most powerful in the world. And Mitch owes him. And the guy's having problems with drug dealers, like drug shipments coming in from uh, Syria. But he doesn't know anything about Syria. And he says, well, Mitch Rapp owes me, a, you know, a, a, owes me a favor. And he speaks the language. He can blend in. He knows everything about the Middle East. We're going to send him over there and figure out what's going on. And so what, because, what starts is sort of Mitch getting sucked into basically helping this guy with his business becomes starts to he realizes starts to involve the russians and an attack uh, a concerted attack on the west he draws this tries to draw the cia back in and try to get help with this and you know chaos ensues it does beg a question that how in the world does a good guy owe a bad guy such a debt well, because there were a bunch of bad guys coming after his girlfriend a couple of books ago, uh-huh. and he needed to find the guy who put the hit out, but uh-huh. nobody could find this guy. He was a cartel leader, or like a drug and narcotics cartel leader, and he knew this guy would know who, where he was, and so he and the guy said, "Yeah, I do know where he is, but what's in it for me?" And Mitch said, "Well, I owe you." And he said, well, that sounds pretty good. Here's his address. So uh, that's how he got sucked into it, is that he had no choice um, but to go to this guy because the CIA, the FBI, DEA, nobody else could find this guy. Um, Interesting idea that just popped into my mind because of something you said about your passion for reading. And I'm really curious to know. 
and I hope it's not going to put you on the spot, but when you are in your downtime, whether it's on the beach or in a cabin, wherever that is, what are you drawn to when you want to escape from your own world and your own work world of writing? Who and or what genre do you really love just losing yourself in? Uh, you know, I read really, really widely. Um, I typically don't necessarily read thrillers all the time anymore. I used to, but now that I write them all day, um, sometimes I like to do different things. Strangely, though, now, because I live in Spain, I read almost exclusively in Spanish. So, because I really need to learn the language better. So, yeah, yeah, so I I just uh, read, you know, like just thinking of things I've read recently, I read a... uh, a book that would translate to uh, Things We Lost in the Fire, which was a Argent- terrific Argentine writer, I wish I could remember her name, who writes short horror stories. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I read just re- The Shadow of the Wind, one of my favorite novels of all time, um, uh, but kind of set in the, during the Spanish Civil War and a little bit, uh, you know, the... The, the Spanish love and the Spanish writers, Spanish language writers love magical realism, so there's a little bit of that kind of stuff in them. And uh, nonfiction, I really like. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say. I, I'm super eclectic with the stuff I read, magazines too, you know. Well, between horror and magic realism and nonfiction, that's a pretty diverse uh, <laughs> range of reading. Yeah. So, well, and I, I think like that different. You know, I like. I learn a lot from that. Like, you know, how do you, you know, from the, from the horror story, short stories, how do you very quickly build tension? You know, and I love people that do that stuff well. Yeah. Because I think, you know, as you know, as a writer, one of the things that can ruin things for you is you start to really see the structure behind books. And you, know, you don't really want to know how the sausage is made. You just want to enjoy the book. But I think that stuff all the time, like, oh, they're going to kill this character they're building and this good, it's going to happen and this is going to, and I can't stop it. Yeah. But really great writers, I can't see any of their architecture. It's just yeah. an incredible, you know, experience still. That is such a good point. I was making this similar point to my wife, Tammy, the other night. We were watching this series. Um, I'm not going to mention it because... <laughs> And uh, you can always tell the ones that have become, I'm going to use the phrase cookie cutter. Uh, We'll be watching, I'll go, that guy right there, he's going to do this. And within seconds, he does that exact same thing. I'm like, now watch, we're going to hit the beat. It's going to go to black, come back and do this. And it does it. And I do it on on, on an unconscious level. Because, again, to your point, you're kind of wired to like, okay, if that just happened, dun, 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 and that just happened, dun, 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 watch out. He's going to throw this at her. And it happens. The people, to your point, the people that fake you out and lead you on those little red herrings, which is getting harder and harder every day because we're getting too damn smart and then does a switchback and you didn't see it coming. You're like, oh, now I'm in on a new level. Yeah. And characters, too. I love like watching characters really strong transform really skillfully because you know that's hard to do and so you know it's not like oh i just need my character to be this way now so now he is you know people that you can really see it happening um i love that kind of stuff so yeah and that and that occurs in all kinds of different if all kinds of different sorts of books so um you know just an elegant turn of phrase i really like you know what a beautiful paragraph i think that like most people probably don't but I go back and read it again because it was just, I know how hard they worked on it. <laughs> I think of, when you said that, I think of a couple of people. The very first person that popped into my head is one of our good friends, Meg Gardner. She can take a sentence. She can take a paragraph and it's an entire story. And I've often asked her, I'm like, Meg, how in the hell did you make that sentence? She goes, well, first of all, it didn't just happen. Second of all, yeah. I wrote it about seven times, and then when I felt it was good, I edited it another, oh, I don't know, five or six times. And then I thought of, instead of that word, what would be more powerful and switched a word? 
And then when I thought about it that way, I'm like, that's just dang smart. And then I started reading with that knowledge and I'm like, that's how she does it. And it doesn't take away from the secret sauce of Meg Gardner. She's just a an amazing talent. But it was a great insight as to, you know, so many people go, just bang it out, you know, bang out the yeah. first one and then bang out the next one. And then when you feel like you got a pretty good idea where you're going, then finesse it. I, yeah, and I feel like it gives a bad impression that like when you're starting out writing, and I know I felt this way, I thought, oh, this is easy for Tom Clancy or whoever <laughs> that I, you know, all the writers I admire, but it's not, you know, <laughs> it looks easy when you read the book, but you don't know what, you know, the year that went into it, the year of suffering that went into getting those words on the page. So um, hopefully people appreciate when they read the books, um, I remember my mo- my mother knew Tom Clancy pretty well. My family was friends with him, and uh, and her telling him, you know, I she had read the book in a day, and he's like, "Oh my God, it took me a year to write that." Yeah. <laughs> what book did I just read in a day? I did just read, and it's the first time I've done it in a long time. I'm not going to be able to pull it up because I read about three books a week. Uh, Anyway, um, and I told this author that I had done that. I had gotten up. Uh, I couldn't sleep. So I was up around 2, 2.30, and I just started reading. And I finished it, you know, sometime late after lunch. And he goes, dude, do you know how long that took me to write? And I'm like, yeah, because, because of this. I said, so what's next? And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just did that thing that everyone hates that you do, and I didn't mean to do it. Like, well, he, I just finished it. It took me a year. <laughs> Well, they miss them. You know, they miss these guys. So, so it's, yeah. it's funny. I was talking to Brad Thor about this recently that it's, you know, you spend all your days with, in me, my case, Mitch Rapp, in case Scott Harvath, and, but you don't realize that the fans just get to see them once a year. Right. And so that year that you don't get to see your friend Mitch or your friend Scott is long. Yeah. But for us, we never left them. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're day in and day out with them. So, uh, yeah, I feel the same way when I read a book where I'm like, wow, where's the next book going to come out? And I know I should never ask that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so it's so funny because it's 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 like if you were to say to a, a builder, I've got a friend up in Lake Tahoe who builds houses and I could see walking up to him and going, hey, Todd, you just built this gorgeous modern classical lodge house it's hand built and etc it's gorgeous how long did it take you oh it's like two and a half years I'm like that's gorgeous when's the next one the next one yeah, yeah. he's like dude <laughs> let, let my hands heal from this one then i'll get right back to you um i got a two-part question for you because i know you've delved in the flynn and ludlam world between those franchises two of the biggest maybe in the world was there one that you felt more um more at home with and I, I, again i don't want to put you on the spot because you're you know rapping rap huh. but on a bigger scale why do you suppose they've had such a long and illustrious career so more at home with what's the secret of the longevity Uh, Those are two really different series, and my experiences with them were really different. Um, You know, the Ludlam stuff was much more, they wanted a book written, and that was it. I was resurrecting a series that they wanted resurrected, and so I had a lot of leeway as to where I could go with it, but not total free hand. And then my job was done. Like, they wanted the book. I gave them the book. That was over. Um, Vince was very different. You know, it was, in many ways, I kind of replaced him. So, you know, I interact with fans. I do promotion. I go on tour. My books, you know, I, I kind of have pretty decent artistic control over them as well, you know, with, within reason. Um, so it was a... It was a little bit like stepping into his shoes when I took this over. I mean, I met, you know, his family and I'd go out to dinner with his brothers. And, you know, so it um, was um, much more immersive, I think, than the the Ludlum stuff. And as far as, you know, 
you know, why those have been uh, the longevity of those. Certainly Ludlam benefited from the fact that they made some really good movies Yeah. out of it. Um, and Vince, you know, it was just, I mean, you know, he just, he just wrote pe- books people loved. Yeah. Salt of the earth too, man. Gone way too soon. Jeez. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Um, as we begin to wrap, uh, but before I ask my closing question, I want to scale, if you will, to borrow a metaphor about your passion for rock climbing. I was reading where you said your elbows have kind of given out, but I'd love to know, would you share that story of how that passion started and carried you for so long? Because it's such a, and to me, it's such a great metaphor for how you've scaled this world of writing hit bestsellers. Oh, you know, I just, um, I'd always loved the outdoors. I grew up in Oregon, but I was living in Baltimore at yeah. the time, working for a big bank there. And, uh, I, you know, I just never got outdoors and stuff. And, and um, it was a, something I had once read in a magazine, a big thing about all these famous, you know, famous climbers yeah. from back in the day that uh, in Camp 4, Yosemite and I'd always wanted to try it. So I, I went to West Virginia and like got lessons. And I mean, it's just the, for the minute I stepped off the ground, I was absolutely passionate about it and ended up moving to Wyoming to pursue it. Um, and, you know, went to work for a bank there and uh, ended up becoming a writer, which was really great because then I could travel all over the world and climb and nobody knew where I was. So, you know, it didn't seem like I was slacking off. So, um, yeah, kind of a, it was really formative for me because, you know, I mean, I worked, you know, my father was an FBI agent. I'd lived in D.C. and London and, you know, hung around with all those people. But when I moved to Wyoming and got immersed in the climbing community, it was just, it was really alternative community with very alternative ideas. And the idea of, you can do anything Mm -hmm. like society and your expectations hold you back to some extent. And I remember I had been climbing with this guy who was a professional climber and he called, I'd I'd only known him for a few weeks or something. And he called me and he said, you know, let's go to Thailand and go climbing for, for a while. I'm like, well, what's a while? He's like, I don't know. We'll get until we get bored. We'll come back, you know, six months. I don't know. And I said, well, I have, you know, I, I have a job. He said, well, quit. And, and I, I, like, it never occurred to me that you could. Yeah. Like, I mean, you could. He did the same thing with me when they were filming The Beach. Remember that with Leonardo DiCaprio? Oh, sure. He called me up one day and he's like, hey, I'm sitting on the beach in Thailand with Leo and I've convinced him that I need an assistant. I'll pay you $400 a day to come out here. We don't really do anything. And um, we're supposed to keep him from falling off a cliff, but he never gets anywhere near a cliff. Oh, that's hilarious. And I was like, well, I have a job. He's like, well, for God's sake, you're really, really bent on this job thing, aren't you? Yeah. And um, it was those people, though, that made me want to try doing something creative and doing something different because I never thought I could. Because, you know, I studied economics. I, sure. you know, was going to be, a, you know, it's the 80s, right? You're going to be an investment banker and yeah. uh, fly on a private jet and all this crap. Yeah. And uh, it never really suited me. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was like that climbing is probably the most influential thing in my life. And all the people that I met and all the places I've been and things I've done, it, it's uh, really formed who I am to some extent. Well, needless to say, you're not afraid of heights or you wouldn't be able to do that. But I think to myself, what, what was that very first day like? And I mean, I, I, I don't mind, I don't mind um, climbing hills, you know, cl- hiking. But the idea of going up a, a, a wall of stone straight up it holds such fear in me that I could not fathom. Like, why not, what, what was the movie? You're going to know it right away. Is it solo or free solo or? Oh, free solo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was and I'm watching solo. that guy, and he's yeah, he's he's climbing without ropes, and your palms are sweating when you're watching this, and I'm like, how does one, how does one do that? 
Well, he's a special case. I yeah. mean, you don't do that under any circumstances would be the answer. You know, you use a rope. Um, a lot of free soloists have not done well over time. Um, not done well, i.e. Uh, yeah, they yeah. died, yes. Yeah. So um, that's kind of worrying. But, yeah, I, you know, the, the great thing about climbing, one of the things I loved about it is, you know, I had all these things going on in my head with work and whatever, you know, just daily life. But all you concentrate on on climbing is the next hold. And I honestly never really thought about how high up I was because I was get, would get just so laser focused on what I was doing that... I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't say that that was ever an issue for me. Now, if I if you took the rope away, I would <laughs> I would melt down. Yeah, that would yeah. not be a great day. But um, yeah, I think it's just a great way, a really nice way to focus yourself. It also takes you to incredible places, and um, you know, meeting incredible people that do things that you can never yeah. imagine. You know. What was your, and then we'll, we'll bounce off of this, what was your closest call? What was one moment where you went, oh man, at the end of that, you went, I was so close to buying the farm. Uh, yeah, so my, probably my worst, yeah, my closest call was in South Africa. And I had done this climb. Um, it was really long. And I was climbing with the guy belaying me, so holding the rope had written the guidebook to the area. So I, I didn't really give much thought to him. I didn't know him very well. And when he was lowering me, uh, and this happens more than you would think it would, um, he ran out of rope. And it, so you have a belay device that keeps the rope on your here, and it went through, and I started to drop. And I was, I would have died if I, if, and he actually managed to reach up and grab the rope. And he was like, Hey, got a little problem. <laughs> and, uh, I looked down and saw him way down there holding that rope. And I, he had, we had gotten on that climb with too short a rope, uh, which I didn't check because he'd written the guidebook. So, oh my uh, I, yeah, I remember that day very it was a long time ago and I remember it very distinctly. So that was probably my worst moment. I remember finally getting down off the thing and taking my cowboy hat, and laying down and sticking it over my face and laying there for about an hour. Yeah. And then I had to tell my track. wife about it on the way home because <laughs> she, she was climbing something on the other side of the crag. And that's a cool thing too because you – did, is it correct? You met your wife rock climbing and you're still well, we together? Well, met right before I start, well, right, like kind of as I was starting. And okay. uh, she really loved it too. So, yeah. which is great because, you know, you got to haul around the world and spend a lot of time on it. Though I think wow. she's probably glad to be retired so she can do something else. Well, so you gave it up because of joint issues, I'm assuming. And and I don't know how Old that happens age. at your your young age of 40 or whatever. Like pretty close to that. Um, do you do you find the same joy in your uh, backcountry skiing or your or your mountain biking? I mean, I know it's I know it's two different worlds, but there has to be a replacement thrill factor for you, right? No, there's no oh. substitute for rock climbing. Oh. There's just no. I mean, and you know, I've been a skier since I was three, so you oh. know, I'd always done that. But uh, and I love mountain biking. I love road, uh, any kind of thing with paddles on it. I love, but. Um, yeah, there's just no, there's no substitute from cruising around the world, camping with weird people and doing these amazing peaks and like doing, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad um, to think about that I don't do it anymore, really. But um, you got to admit at some point that it's it's very much a young person's game and you've got to admit that. I mean, there, there came a day and it wasn't really, I wasn't that old. I was probably in my mid thirties where I decided, do I want to be able to lift my arms above my head? You know, when I'm 50 and I thought, yeah, yeah I probably do. <laughs> so I'm going to take up a different sport. It mm -hmm. takes that much out of you, that constant wear and tear on that position. Yeah. The wear and tear gets really bad. And you know, yeah. just as you get older, you just, it's easier to get injured.
So I've sure. ruptured the tendons in probably every finger except one. I've, well, you know, tendonitis. I, you get to the point where you, you come home and you have a big bucket of ice and you stick your elbows in it. And yeah, it's probably not a good idea in the long run. <laughs> so I mean, but it was, it was terrifying to give up. I mean, it's sort of the, sort of your meaning of life, right? Yeah. And uh, what do you do? One day you wake up, you're like, well, I quit climbing. What do I do? I got to go train. No, 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 I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Big old well, garden. <laughs> so if you take rock climbing, which is the pinnacle, to borrow another metaphor, out of the, uh, the equation, and you bring it down to earth, and you're either, you know, biking or skiing, is that enough to keep the thrill, the thrill real for Kyle Mills? Or is it? Do you think, okay, is there one thing I could step a little bit more dangerous? And I'm not talking pickleball, mister. So just, you know, hold on there. That uh, maybe replay, get, gets closer to a little bit of the thrill without all the dangerous impact on one's body? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I never really found climbing to be that thrilling. Oh. Like, it's much safer than people think. So, oh. um, I mean, that one thing that I just talked to you about was really my only really close call uh, yeah. over the course of my life. It wasn't, be, it was beyond my control. Um, so for me, it was the chess game, you know, and mm -hmm. climbs are graded in difficulty by number, which mm -hmm. I found very appealing because I'm a very number oriented guy, which is weird to be a writer, but so you could always go one harder. That was uh. what my quest was about. How hard could I go? And mm -hmm. I loved the training and the science of the training and how could I get better and the chess game of, you know, you have to orchestrate very hard climbs. You spend days and days figuring out every move to, this, to the millimeter so you can make it. And that, when, when I substituted that for biking, I got the same sort of obsessive mentality. How fast can I get? You know, like, how would I train to do that? And I met all the bike racers and trained with them and like so it was that game of you know self-improvement and figuring out how to do it the best way possible and things like that skiing's different because the better you get at skiing the more dangerous it gets typically um so i i have a break in my head on skiing i think i could do that yeah but i'm not going to <laughs> And that break's going to save your life, yeah. And that's like the majority of my friends who have died in, you know, live, which is kind of a depressing thing to say, but when you live in Wyoming and you're an outdoor person, that happens. It's mostly skiers, not climbers. Oh, you're because kidding of, me. Yeah, because of avalanches. Oh, yeah, I never thought about that. The great Hard thing about rock is it's been there a million years and you're pretty sure it's going to be there tomorrow. That big thing of snow... You're not sure where it's going to be tomorrow. And you could be in it when it decides it wants to move. Oh, good point. Never thought about it that way. Well, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that because it's just, you know, it, it allows me to live some of that world vicariously because there's no way in hell I would get up on that side of the rock. Um, as we wrap the show, best piece of writing advice is the kind of the hallmark of the show. A lot of people love to hear that. And I know you got one. And you've, 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 you've certainly put in enough time to come up with that little golden nugget. Golden so, nugget. Yeah, give us the golden nugget. Finish Sir. writing the book. <laughs> Don't go back and write one chapter for the next eight years. You can fix okay. it later. That would be my advice to people. Finish the book. Because somebody once said, was it Nora Roberts? I'm not sure. Quotes are always really apocryphal. Uh, you, you can fix a bad page, but you can't fix a blank page. Yeah. And that is a very true story, you know, and, and your book might end up going somewhere completely different. So don't get bogged down. Keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I, I write mean, chapters all the time where I think, wow, that was unmitigated garbage. <laughs> but just going to move forward. Yeah. I'll fix it later. I'll fix it in the mix, as we used to say <laughs> in radio. Um, well, that is good advice. And it, it you know, I, sometimes the simplicity is the best because, you know, just I always say, Step one, put your ass in the chair. Step two, start writing. Step yeah. three, do it again. Rinse and repeat, you know, good for you. Yeah, and you know, the other one is don't think of it as one thing. You know, like right. I always, 
I still get terrified. Every time I finish a book, I think writing a novel is impossible. Like it's all these so complex and to get it all to fit together. It's so long. I can't do this. 23 yeah. books. I still think of that. And then I think, no, 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 just write a page. And yeah. if you do that 400 times, yeah. your novel will be done. It's just 400 times. I mean, yeah. it's just a number. Yeah. Well, just a number. This has been amazing. I know that the bell, the little bell of cocktail hour, uh, happy hour is ringing. So thank you so much for spending the time with me. This has been awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think, you know, next time we, whether it's BoucherCon next year or Thriller Fest or wherever we bump into, I want to make sure I grab your hand and shake it and say, you know, see you face to face and say, you know, what a great impact you've had on all of us. And as and while we're sad to see Mitch Rap go from your hand and Code Red, uh, we feel good about Don Bentley taking over. But you know, we yeah. The great thing is, is you know that you gave it your best run. You had a hell of a lot of fun doing it, and you did a magnificent job. Well, thank you. It has been fun. It's been really a terrific experience. Your front row seat to the best thrillers. The thrill-